Good morning, church. I'm Pastor Marty, pastor of Algonquin and Central United Methodist Churches, and I greet you on this, uh, the day that the Lord has made. Uh, looking outside, it's beginning to look a lot like Christmas, isn't it? Special greetings also to those of you who are watching us uh, online. Uh, a word of instruction for you, and that is, uh, should you have, have a prayer request that you would like shared with the congregation, and you are comfortable typing that in the comments line, please feel free to do so, and then that information will get to me um, so that I may share it with the congregation. Uh, for those of us uh, who are gathered in person, uh, a few words of instruction. Somewhere within the pew should be an attendance register, and uh, we ask that uh, as you have opportunity that you would fill that out and let us know of your attendance today. And should you have a prayer request that you would like to share with the congregation, feel free to share that uh, on the green cards uh, that are in the pew uh, in front of you and you can just drop that into the offering plate and that will come to me as well. Uh, I did want to uh, make mention that uh, as our finance committee did meet uh, this past week, I just want, if you haven't filled out a pledge card but want to fill out a pledge card, it is very helpful uh, for finance committee as we put a budget together to kind of have an idea of what, what we have to work with. Uh, do please uh, feel free to pick one of these up. They're just right outside where the bulletins are. This can be uh, completed and you can drop it into an offering plate. So you can also give it uh, to Sharon Jones uh, or myself. We'll just see to it that that gets uh, to, to the office. So just a, a friendly reminder uh, with that. As we prepare for our worship time, we do like to start uh, by sharing together with our mission statement. Uh, that is found on the front of your bulletin, and I do invite you to read along with me. Connecting all people to God by building bridges of caring, outreach, and acceptance. I invite you to stand for this morning's call to worship. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into God's presence with singing. Know that the Lord who made us is God. We are the Lord's. We are the people of God, the sheep of God's pasture. Enter God's gates with thanksgiving and God's courts with praise. Give thanks and bless God. For the Lord is good. Please join us in our opening hymn, Come Ye Faithful People Come, found in your red hymnal on page 694.
Shall we pray? God of grace and glory, reveal yourself through our lives and our love. Shine your wisdom and truth into our hearts this day. Help us to know the hope to which we are called, that we may be the servants you craft us to be. In your glory and grace we pray, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Please be seated, and I invite our young people to join me up front. Feel free to have a seat if you're more comfortable that way. So we've been talking about something called the Ten Commandments. So how many commandments do you think there might be? <laughs> very good, very good. You are listening. We've talked about eight of them so far. So how many are left? Two, very good. And the two that I want to talk about, the first one says, you shall not bear witness against your neighbor. What does that even mean? I think what it means is that we don't uh, tell an untruth about someone to get them in trouble or to place them in a bad position. So let's suppose that um, you and I are um, competing and that we want something, and I tell someone I'm more deserving of it because this person does that when in fact they don't. Now, some... And this is to the, uh, more to the audience. Some read this as you shall not lie. But here's some, I always like to give you something to think about. I don't think that you're breaking the Ten Commandments if you're in a situation like we saw in Germany when the people said, there are no Jews here. I don't think we were, that was breaking a, uh, a commandment at all. They were looking to protect uh, those people. But we certainly don't want to have tell untruths about people, and that's very important. And then the last thing says, you shall not covet. And that's probably a word that we don't use very much, but what that means is we don't have a strong desire for other people's stuff so much that we absolutely positively might even think about taking it or, would, or that it so occupies our thoughts that I want to have that and we shouldn't. As a matter of fact, the Bible does talk to us elsewhere to learn to be thankful for what we have. Now, there's nothing wrong with having a goal and working towards that. But if something reaches a point where it occupies our thoughts all the time and that we think that our lives aren't going to be complete until we get that and maybe even take it from someone, that's probably, that isn't what God would ask uh, for us. We should be thankful that God has blessed other people we should be thankful for the blessings that we have. And yet, there's still nothing wrong with having a dream or having a goal uh, in mind. So let me just real quick go over. God is number one, and we don't have any other idols that we think about. We respect God's name. We take time to rest. We honor our mother and our father. We value life, and we do not take life away from someone. We honor our relationships and our commitments. We don't steal. 
we don't tell untruths about people, and we learn to be happy with what we have. These are actually 10 rules to have a pretty happy life if you can live in, into these to guide us. And so will you pray with me? Dear Lord, thank you for loving me. Thank you for these commandments. Help me to obey them all. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good job. Thank you. Both of our readings this morning talk about sheep. Our first reading speaks of God being our shepherd and gathering all of the sheep together. Once the sheep are gathered, God judges the sheep who bullied others. Let these words cause us to reflect on how we've treated those around us, especially those who are less privileged. Our first scripture reading is from Ezekiel chapter 30, verses 11 through 16, and verses 20 through 24. For this is what the Sovereign Lord says, I myself will search for my sheep and look after them. As the shepherd looks after his scattered flock when he is with them, so will I look after my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places where they were scattered on a day of clouds and darkness. I will bring them out from the nations and gather them from the countries and I will bring them into their own land. I will pasture them on the mountains of Israel, in the ravines, and in all the settlements in the land. I will tend them in a good pasture, and the mountain heights of Israel will be their grazing land. There, there they will lie down in good grazing land, and there they will feed in a rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I myself will tend my sheep and have them lie down, declares the Sovereign Lord. I will search for the lost and bring back the strays. I will bind up the injured and strengthen the weak, but the sleek and the strong I will destroy. I will shepherd the flock with justice. Therefore, this is what the Sovereign Lord says to them. See, I myself will judge between the fat sheep and the lean sheep. Because you shove with flank and shoulder, butting all the weak sheep with your horns until you have driven them away, I will save my flock, and they will no longer be plundered. I will judge between one sheep and another, I will place over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he will tend them. He will tend them and be their shepherd. I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David will be prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken.
Thank you, choir. Our second scripture reading comes from the Gospel of Matthew. And in the church calendar, this is the last Sunday of the year. It is known as Christ the King Sunday. And so the lectionary, which has three different cycles, no matter what cycle you're in, this Sunday always talks about Jesus in, um, as our king in some kingly role. And we find ourselves in the Gospel of Matthew, finishing up what has been a long conversation that has really been some tough stuff. And this is probably, again, a very difficult passage for us to read and to ponder. Hear the words of Jesus speaking. When the Son of Man comes in glory and all the angels are with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will say to the sheep, he will put the sheep on the right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go visit you? The king will reply, Truly, I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did it for me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? He will reply, truly, I tell you, Whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. The word of God for the people of God. God. Pre-9-11, in 2001, I had a dream trip to the state of Washington to meet my cousin and her family. She had talked about the paradise that she lived in, and at this point in my life, I just have to say, she apparently has never lived in the UP. However, I will admit that the state of Washington was beautiful where we were. We were outside of the Seattle area. And during that time that we were staying with them, I had a morning routine where I would get up and I would walk out to the mailbox and I would get the, the newspaper that was delivered uh, overnight so that I could read the newspaper with my coffee. Something I don't get to do today, really, uh, because of the changes in technology. But I remember one day that when I walked out, have you ever had a strange feeling that something's different? 
And so I'm standing by this mailbox and I'm like, something is different. I can't, I can't put my finger on it. I look at the mailbox, I look around, and then I look to my right, and there in all of its splendor was Mount Rainier. And I came marching in to the house, and I said, there is no way that I've been going out for the last four days and I've missed that mountain. And thankfully, she said, you probably didn't miss it. The weather has to just be a certain way. And we have a saying out here that the mountains are out today. And so the mountains were out that day. However, I need to admit to you that as recently as this morning, I did display how unobservant I can be. I was in the bathroom, I was shaving, and Tina came in and she said, do you like the poinsettia that I placed in here? It wasn't three feet away from me sitting in the corner, but I was so focused on that angelic appearance in the mirror <laughs> that apparently I didn't see anything else. This is a passage that talks a lot about seeing. Now, I will admit to you that as a pastor, I love it whenever I have verses on sheep. Because no matter what I say, I can get away with having a bad service. <laughs> but I won't even attempt to pull the wool over your eyes this morning. This is a tough, difficult, serious passage that I agree with Mark Twain when he said, it isn't the passages that I don't understand that bother me, it's the passages that I do understand that bother me. And that when I read all of scripture, this is something that makes me squirm. And maybe you feel that too. I often like to say that God comforts the afflicted, but afflicts the comfortable. And this is one of those passages that afflicts the comfortable, afflicts the privileged, afflicts the clueless sometimes, or the unobservant. In other words, it afflicts me, and maybe it afflicts you. And as we look at this passage, we can see why it's selected for Christ the King Sunday, because we see it's the Son of Man coming in all of his glory, Jesus coming in all of his glory, that he sits on the throne. Christ is the King. And one of his first acts as Christ as the King is the judgment of the nations. the separation of the sheep from the goats. And there are so many levels to this particular passage that I don't know that I can do justice to it in the 90 to 120 minutes I have. But I think that there's a few things that we can think about this morning. I think one of the first things that we can think about should come to us as a bit of a relief. It is Christ who does the judging. It isn't you, and it isn't me. If you think you are the judge, I have two words for you. You're fired. <laughs> Jesus is the judge. And by golly, I have had my fill 
of meeting self-righteous, sanctified, I better stop before I get in trouble, people who think that they know who the sheep are and that they know who the goats are, and without exception, they're absolutely certain that they are a sheep. And they're also pretty certain that I'm not if I don't think exactly as they do. Jesus is the judge of the sheep and the goats. Not you, not me. And if we could begin to live into that, do you imagine how freeing that is to, gosh, I'm not responsible for determining the eternal fate of all of you. I'm just called to be faithful, to follow Jesus, and to live like Jesus, and to let Jesus be the one doing the judge. Do you think our omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent God really needs our help. Jesus is the king. Jesus will separate. And let us be mindful that Jesus as the judge, God has said, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. This is the Lord's business and not ours. So I think that we can take a great deal of comfort from that. That responsibility has been removed from our shoulders. I think another thing that we can take encouragement from is that what is asked of us is not monumental. Every one of us have the, has the capability to share something with someone to eat. We all have the capability and the resources to give someone something to drink. We all have the capabilities to show kindness and hospitality to strangers. We have plenty of opportunity and the resources to share clothes with those who are in need. If we went back home today and sorted our closets, we might be surprised at just how many clothes we have that we could share with those in need. I have shared this story on many occasions, but I think it fits really well in this context that I think at my judgment, I don't think that anywhere near the top whatever number of things that I may have done well in this life will involve my sermons. But I think that one of the things that will... I, you wanted to give an amen to that, Ray. I saw that. Yeah, yeah. I saw that. But what I do think will be up towards the top I can't even take credit for it. Once again, I was the clueless person. It was my saintly wife who said, it's so-and-so's birthday, let's take a cake over to her. So anybody remember the Bill Knapp's cakes that you could once get for eight bucks? And we bought the Bill Knapp's chocolate cake and we took that over and To me, what was just $8 worth of flour and sugar and eggs meant all the world to this woman because no one else had remembered her birthday, not even her husband. And when she broke down and sobbed, oh my, that what I thought was just a cake, meant everything. It was validation. It was reaffirmation. It was love. It was way more than a cake. And beloved of God, you and I 
have the opportunity to love and to serve in small but thoughtful and faithful ways that make a huge, huge difference. A rather large megachurch was preparing to welcome its new pastor. And on that Sunday, the megachurch was packed. And in their midst was a first-time guest, a homeless man, who had spent time wandering around the grounds before church, being ignored by most everybody. And perhaps to the dismay of some people, he decided to come in and sit in the back pew. He wasn't dressed very well. He was certainly disheveled. And there really wasn't a whole lot of excitement on the part of those in the church to sit near that individual. 